so this is Ronda, Spain. This is where Hemingway spent quite a bit of time. Uh, he said it was like the perfect place to hide out, you know, if you're looking to hide out with somebody that you love in uh, the middle of Spain. And after walking in here, you know, sure enough, I mean, this is one of the most absolutely stunning things I've ever seen in my entire life, I mean, without question. At some point, you just have to ask yourself, you know, how beautiful can a place get? I mean, I didn't know. I didn't know places could get this beautiful. I say that with all sincerity, too. I mean, there have been only a handful of places this gorgeous that I've ever seen <laughs> in the entire fucking world. I didn't. I'm a little bit of a loss for words. There's no question as to why somebody would come to get work done here. It's, it's stunning. It's stunning. There is one town that would be better than Aranjuez to see your first bullfight in. If you're only going to see one. And that is Ronda. Ronda. That is where you go if you go to Spain on a honeymoon or if you ever want to bolt with someone. The entire town and as far as you can see in any direction is romantic background and there is a hotel that is so comfortable so well run where you can eat so well and usually have a cool breeze at night that with the romantic background and the modern comfort if a honeymoon or an elopement is not a success in Rwanda it would be as well to start for Paris and both commence making your own friends. It is built on a plateau in a circle of mountains and the plateau is cut by a gorge that divides the two towns and ends in a cliff that drops sheer to the river and plain below where you can see the dust rising from the mule trains Along the road, the people who settled it when the Moors were driven away came from Cordoba and the north of Andalusia. Of course, you can't actually see a bullfight here anymore. It's, I just went over to the Plaza de Toros and it's actually just a um, museum. One of those things where you like take the little headphone and it guides you around and you have all these people just like looking at what once was, which was actually you know, at one point very cool as he's talking about it here. Uh, and very interesting. But now it's sort of just a tourist attraction. But the view is still gorgeous, I'm happy to say. The people who settled it when the Moors were driven away came from Cordoba. The bullring at Ronda was built towards the end of the 18th century and is of wood. Uh, I don't know about that anymore. Oh, I'm hurting. It's kind of cramping up. But it stands at the edge of the cliff, and after the bullfight, when the bulls have been skinned and dressed in their meat sent out for sale on the carts, they drag the dead horses over the edge of the cliff, and the buzzards that have circled over the town and high in the air over the ring all day drop down to feed on the rocks below the town. Now that would have been something fucking amazing to see. I suppose that from a modern point of view, that is a Christian point of view, the whole bullfight is indefensible. There is certainly much cruelty. There is always danger, either sought or unlooked for. And there is always, always death. And I should not try to defend it now, only to tell, honestly, the things that I found true about it. To do this, I must be altogether frank, or try to be, and if those who read this decide with disgust that, is, that it is written by someone who lacks there the reader's fineness of feeling, I can only plead that this may be true. But whoever reads this can only truly make such a judgment when he or she has seen the things that are spoken of and knows truly what their reactions to them would be. Good morning, everybody. Good afternoon. Welcome to Better Than Food Book Reviews. I'm back. I'm back.
I'm back in La La Land. So today is more Hemingway. More Hemingway. I know I just reviewed him a little while ago, but I was visiting Spain and it's perfectly topical. So. So the question is, can the ritual slaughter of an animal be art? I don't know the answer to this question. I don't know. And after seeing a bullfight for the first time in Madrid, in the same ring that the famous bullfighter Manuel Granero was killed, gored to death on May the 7th in 1922, I am more hesitant than ever to make statements about bullfighting, its history, and its present condition. So, I read this. Death in the Afternoon was written by Ernest Hemingway and published in 1932, and bullfighting has, since then, I am sure, changed quite a bit. But I'd like to present to you one of the greatest books I've ever read. A colossal treatise on the classic Hemingway themes, full of travel, courage, and of course, death. If you've read any of Ernest Hemingway, the ultra-famous, influential American author extraordinaire, then you've got a good grasp of his mannerisms, the way he writes, the way he speaks, the conviction and the economy of his writing. And I've talked about him a little before, a couple of reviews back in uh, March, uh, when I read the short story, the, the Short Happy Life of Francis McComer, that uh, was a big recommendation from Werner Herzog. Um, not that I got it personally. That would have been cool, though, right? <laughs> but, uh, you know, let's dig, let's dig even deeper into this guy, because he is fascinating. And uh, if I'm going to review an author, uh, you know, that close twice, then, uh, then there's a good reason, you know. Uh, I'm not just running out of material. I really think this book is fantastic, despite, you know, what, what you may feel about the subject matter. Um, he, he really is one hell of a man, okay? This is a guy who, if he did not truly live, then, you know, uh, he, then he wrote well enough about it to convince everybody otherwise. Ernest Hemingway cast a giant shadow over 20th century fiction when he was writing in the 20s up until the mid-50s. Um, the best book to talk... Oh, the best way to talk about him would be like this, I think, in several different videos, you know, because obviously this is an entire body of work spread out over a lifetime, written by, you know written with different ideas and priorities in mind at each stage of his life, of course. Um, and when it's all, and all of it is delicious and fascinating in its own way. The Sun Also Rises is his first novel. Some say it's the most important, but it's very different from his last novel, which is sort of this novel of reflection in a really tragic way called Islands in the Stream, which was published posthumously, I think. And both of these are very different from The Old Man and the Sea, which is maybe his most well-known novel, and one that has been forced on high school students for decades, it seems, and whose eyes glaze over with a Pavlovian response at the mere mention of it. Nothing ruins a good book like being forced to read it. So Spain, yes, I went to Spain. I love Spain, I'd been there a couple of times before, and I went and drove across it on a location scout for something I'm doing. And I drove everywhere. Drove everywhere, up and down, up to San Sebastian and all the way down to Sevilla. I wanted to see it and see a bullfight for the first time and get a little lost with my lady friend. There's much more to the story, but all in due time. I was trying to write then, and I found the greatest difficulty, aside from knowing truly what you really felt, rather than what you were supposed to feel and had been taught to feel, was to put down what really happened in action, what the actual things were which produced the emotion that you experienced. After traveling and living in France and Spain and being seriously injured in the war at a young age, Hemingway began writing first as a journalist and finally as a novelist. And he developed a minimalist style that was focused on um, omitting every single thing he deemed unnecessary from his prose. It's been dubbed the iceberg theory, right? Stemming from an analogy he makes in this very book, Death in the Afternoon. If a writer of prose knows enough of what he is writing about, he may omit things that he knows, and the reader, if the writer is writing truly enough, will have a feeling of those things as strongly as though the writer had stated them. The dignity of movement of being an... I 
The dignity of movement of an iceberg is due to only one-eighth of it being above water. A writer who omits things because he does not know them only makes hollow places in his writing. And that's very interesting because, you know, you're kind of... You're... Interpreting information and bringing your own experience to it at the same time. Maybe that's the nice thing about uh, Hemingway is, you know, he doesn't treat you as if you're stupid. He came to this... Hemingway came to this after reading uh, some of Rudyard Kipling, you know, who was the author of The Jungle Book. The irony of this is that uh, the subject matter of his writing is, concerns excess past the limits, right? It's all about excess, you know? While the writing presents, the writing itself, you know, physically is the polar opposite. He throws everything away. He's really not one to waste time. He is not a hoarder of words. So what is the deal with the bullfight, right? What's this thing all about? Though seeming crude and sort of primitively cruel, the bullfight conjures many preconceived notions, right? You have a strong visceral gut reaction, knee-jerk reaction usually to this sort of thing. Strong opinions and criticism, while simultaneously being per a particularly hard phenomenon to explain, right? It seems simple. It's not simple at all. The bullfight's theme, the overarching prominent subject in which you are immersed and, it's presumed if Ernie is correct, enraptured with, is death, which he argues is actually sort of culturally exclusive, particularly, you know, to the Spanish. And if you've ever been to Spain and you've been to England and you've been to France and you've been to America and you've been to Germany you can, or Japan, you can kind of get an idea of what he means by this. There is a fascination with death and an ability to stare it in the face uh, or a fascination with, you know, the knowledge of one's own death that the Spanish are not afraid to look at, right? England is a different story. The bullfight resides in the same realm as pagan sacrifice, as, you know, uh, the fascination with murder, with war, with crime, far more than hunting or death delivered pragmatically with a use, right? Bullfighting is in the realm of excess. You know, humans, you know, excess as it pertains to humans. You know, which is to say it's in the realm of death. The entire machine operates on the knowledge of death, that there will be a death, that that is the trajectory, the climax, you know, the, the end of the story, the promise of the sight of it from the bull, and the very, very real risk of the sight of human death, which leads us to contemplate our own horrified and fascinated. In the display that takes place, there is a jubilant, exuberance of life stemming from the very risk of death, which is the fascinating, seemingly contradictory, you know, movement. It's been said that when the bull comes close to striking, you know, when his horn passes by the abdomen of the torero, some women back in the day were able to climax in the crowds simply from watching it. The bullfight is a Spanish institution. It has not existed because of the foreigners and tourists, but always in spite of them and any step to modify it to secure their approval, the tourists, which it will never have, and he was right about that, this is 1932, remember that, is a step toward its complete suppression. And more steps have been taken. Barcelona outlawed it, Portugal uh, has a different method of it. Uh, I think the north of Spain is it's pretty much essentially gone. Uh, Sevilla still has it, Madrid still has it, you know, Andalusia. Um, I don't know about Valencia, maybe, but uh, obviously it's not nearly as popular as it once was. Um, Hemingway also wrote that anything capable of arousing passion in its favor will surely raise as much passion against it. Totally true. There are undoubtedly some questions you will have, such as, you know, can bulls fight more than once. That was one of my biggest, you know, my, my biggest questions in the beginning, you know, because that seems like more, that seems like a fair fight, you know, if like a bull wins and he gores the fuck out of a matador, then, you know, he keeps going, right? He just, he, he, they don't kill him, they just, <laughs> they keep using the same bulls. Well, they did that, as a matter of fact, way back in the early days, but here's the problem. Bulls are not stupid. This is something bullfighters know very well. Bulls are neither frightened nor stupid. In the early days of bullfighting, 
Bulls were allowed to be fought which had been in the ring before, and so many men were killed in the bull ring that on November 20th, 1567, Pope Pius V issued a papal edict excommunicating all Christian princes who should permit bullfights in their countries and denying Christian burial to any person killed in the bull ring. The church only agreed to tolerate bullfighting, which continued steadily in Spain in spite of the edict, when it was agreed that the bulls should appear only once in the ring. 1567. And there was another anecdote about one of these bulls that, <laughs> I don't know if, how much of it is legend and how much of it is true, but there was an anecdote about this one bull that did survive in the ring. One bull, which was a great favorite in the capias of the province of Valencia, killed 16 men and boys and badly wounded over 60 in a career of just five years. So, so like I said, I went to Madrid to a bullfight to see what I could see. What I hadn't realized that I had actually, was that I had actually purchased tickets for a Carrera de Rejones as opposed to what I had greatly anticipated was going to be a Corrida de Toros. So the difference you see is substantial. The Corrida, the corrida de Rejones is uh, all bullfighting on horseback. The matadors, the toreros, they're on horseback. They're on horses. There's very, very, very little risk, which, which is very true. It's not just me saying it. You can see it and you can, you can look up articles about it. There's very, very little risk to the men themselves, to the toreros, right? Instead, they just have the horse take all the risk. They do these fancy sort of movements on the horse, and they make it dance, and then they make it run away from this bull, which is charging and goring at this horse's ass the entire time, around the ring and around the ring until it gets worn out, and then they have their team, their quadrilla, and they go and they like do the, the thing, and then they eventually uh, slaughter it. It's a very, very unfair fight with any, with little to no risk for the man killing the bull, right? Which, of course, takes away from the whole factor of the bullfight in the first place, or what I had anticipated or really wanted to see, which was something sacred, courageous, impressive, and so on, as Hemingway goes on in the book. The spectator going to a bullfight for the first time cannot expect to see the combination of the ideal bull and the ideal fighter for that bull, which may occur not more than 20 times in all Spain in a season, and it would be wrong for him to see that the first time. The bullfight is not a sport in the Anglo-Saxon sense of the word. That is, it is not an equal contest or an attempt at, equal, at an equal contest between a man and a bull. Rather, it is a tragedy, the death of the bull, which is played more or less well by the bull and the man involved, and in which there is danger for the man, but certain death for the animal. So I had that in mind, of course, I knew that going in, but what this looked like when I went to this bullfight, which you can see in this footage, was uh, a bull that looked tired and uninterested in any sort of combat, literally, quite literally, like looking for an escape, an escape route, you know, like an exit, like it just kind of like accidentally wandered in here by mistake, and then it's like, oh, fuck, I gotta fight now, you know? And this was a, an animal that was being harassed by several men, a couple of them on horseback. Gore, you know, this poor bull is like running around and it's got like shaved horns because they've dulled them and it's goring these horses in the ass and the horses are frightened and the bull is frightened and nobody knows. I mean, like, it was just so pathetic. Uh, before finally being killed, very badly, I might add, by these guys, the particular guys I saw, it took several thrusts to sever the aorta back then. You know, a good kill is considered, you know, they, they uh, take out the sword, they line it up, and the bull charges, and then they go through, and they just, like, drive the sword right up there, and the bull, if it's a good kill, will die right then. But it took several thrusts for these guys to like sever the vein, and you know, by they just seemed goofballs who were completely impressed with themselves. And you know, it didn't help that you had this kind of like corny sort of band playing, you know, they're like you know, you know, like in the <laughs> times have changed, ladies and gentlemen. That is unfortunately what I saw. It would be very hard to convince myself of other. Right, I'd really have to be completely deluded to say like what I saw was not, forgive the pun, bullshit. I have to say, for the sake of honesty, that it was I saw a bad bullfight. I don't know how much it differs from what it was as to what it is now, what it currently is, 
But I imagine what Hemingway witnessed many, 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 many years ago is worlds away from what I saw. So that's been my big curiosity and wonder with this book, which is so fresh and physical and dangerous and beautifully written and intense, you know? We left, my gal and I left when the bull came up to us and just kind of like went up, like literally trotted away from the matador, you know, the, like we left when the bull trotted away from the guy on horseback who was trying to fight it. Like this was like the third time it had left him. It just like wandered away looking for an exit, came up and like stood directly in front of us just staring. And that was the most nervous I had been because I've seen them jump you know, jump the gate, and we were very close, and so, like, I was like, honey, <laughs> took my beer, and got the fuck out of there, it was just pathetic, yes, I walked out of the bullfight, yes, I did, boo, boo, that was the third bull, I think, they kill six every fight, but, man, Yeah, it was just tough to take seriously. Tough to take seriously. At the same time, I will see another one. Maybe in Spain, maybe in Mexico, maybe I don't know where. But I will go again. And uh, this book is glorious. It is. My recommendation to you, save that you're not a member of PETA, and if you are, fuck off. Uh, my recommendation is this. Go. Watch. Measure your reaction. Read the book first, or not. Think about it. Think about it some more. If it's not for you, you will know very quickly, which he is also quick to write. You will know very quickly if it's for you or not. But if you're like me, you've noticed that there's something more complex at work than a snuff circus, though a bad bullfight can seem just like that. Even though I saw one that sucked for the first time, you can't write a book like this or have an audience like bullfighting has across the world without something profound at least occasionally occurring. Is it rational to kill this many bulls before you get to a fight that produces a sacred reaction bonding not only the audience with the fighter, but everyone with the knowledge of their own mortality? No, it's not. Is it cruel to kill all those bulls? Yes. Despite the fact that they are eaten, you know, the meat is sold or whatever, and what, it depends on the, the culture and the country, but yes, of course it's cruel, yes. Is it useful, productive, or reasonable to focus on so much death? Does it make sense? No! No, it doesn't. Is it human? Fundamentally, absolutely, resoundingly, yes. Yes, it is. Is bullfighting exclusively male? Well, no. No, actually, it's not. Though, of course, they dominate the, the sport, yes. But, uh, no. You should check out... Uh, Conchita Centron, who was a very, I think they called her the Golden Goddess. She was, a, I think, Chilean, but she might have been a Portuguese bullfighter. And there are some images of this woman that are just incredible. Uh, and there's, there are many others. So, no, it is not an entirely male sport. What else is like a bullfight? Nothing on earth. Not that I can think of. This is its own, this is so old. It's, again, it's like fucking pagan. Right? This is some seriously old culture. It is a decadent art in every way, and like most decadent things, it reaches its fullest flower at its rottenest point, which is the present. And again, he was writing that in 1932, after watching bullfights for something like five years. He said it took him about five years to write about it, and he wished he could have waited ten. It's pretty great, you know, Orson Welles actually, uh, there's, a, there's a great interview with Orson Welles where he's talking about, like, um, Orson Welles says, you know, well, he thought he invented bullfighting, you know, kind of like, uh, snubbing Hemingway, but then he's like, he, he kind of like whips his head back and he's like, well, maybe he did. You know, if you like red wine, Trader Joe's is a $3 bottle, but so does Whole Foods. It's a pretty decent cab for 3 bucks. From what I remember, we're going to find out here. 
So death in the afternoon is about bullfighting, but that's the tip of the iceberg. Ha ha ha. Pun, pun, pun. You know? It is. Contained within this book are meditations on honesty, masculinity, courage, war, bravery, and writing, of course, and death. <laughs> if you didn't know that Hemingway killed himself, you probably ought to know that if you're new to this sort of thing or you're a younger person. Yeah, Hemingway shot himself in the head after he was starting to kind of lose it. And then it suicide kind of runs in the Hemingway family too I think uh, his sons or his daughters or several others were killing themselves not good not bad just interesting in the book you know he mentions all the bullfighters he's known you know Juan Belmonte and Jose Lito and all the, the very very famous ones they were friends of his they were sort of like the rock stars of their time you know, hanging out at these smoky bars and <laughs> getting syphilis from all the prostitutes that were hanging around them and making money, making a lot of money for the time as long as they were fighting. Um, he mentions all the bullfighters he's known, the brave ones, the strange ones, the ones who were, you know, incredible, nobody liked them, uh, and the ones who were, in his opinion, complete and total cowards and uh, shams, basically, posers. Uh, the best and the worst. He's extremely opinionated. He's obviously he's extremely opinionated, but he outlines every opinion he has. Uh, who knows if any of it is true? You know, it's so old at this point. You know, I who could say? But it makes for a damn good read, and you'll have more than a little knowledge on the subject by the time you're finished with it. And it won't take you too long. It's pretty easy. Um, it reads like fiction. Again, very economical with uh, very little dead weight. It's just a fucking straight shot. It's a bullet. Belmonte worked that way because of his lack of stature, his lack of strength, because, his feeble, because of his feeble legs. He did not accept any rules made without testing whether they might be broken, and he was a genius and a great artist. The way Belmonte worked was not a heritage, nor a development. It was a revolution. <laughs> oh, that's still pretty good. That's not bad. It's kind of sweet. So there's this really funny back and forth with this fictional old lady in the crowd, you know, of listeners in Hemingway's book. He just invents this old lady from a crowd and uh, he selects her out and there's this... Uh, this constant uh, uh, kind of back and forth dialogue between Hemingway, the guy who's telling the story, and this old lady. You know, he uses her to illustrate points and bring up questions that he predicts the audience, the reader, might have at that point. And uh, she argues with him or complains that all his technicalities about the fight are dull, which in some cases is true, but he clearly viewed them as necessary to some degree. And the self-conscious reflection, which is, uh, you know, depicted by a strange old lady, is really funny, considering it's, you know, Hemingway who's writing the book. Um, that was one thing that doesn't come across very often that I think another, that Orson Welles was also talking about, is, you know, he was really a fucking funny dude for being as seriously, you know, as serious as he's, uh, as he's represented, you know, or how serious the subjects are. He was apparently a really funny guy, which isn't surprising at all. Um... You know, Hemingway is the mythical straight white American male. And that's not something to be derided or shunned. That's fucking cool, right? Whoever you are reading it, he is the fucking archetype. He's the badass. He's the man, the guy. And that's all I have to say on the subject. Hopefully you're interested in seeing a bullfight. If not, then you'll never be, and you can move on to whatever the fuck it was that was more exciting in your life. And watch Midnight in Paris, just for that scene between Owen Wilson and Ernest Hemingway when they're sitting in the car, and he's just, like, speaking the same way that he's writing. It's really, really funny. That actor, whoever he was, just nailed it. It's very funny. Uh, it's to die for. Link below. And I'm glad to be back. Life's too short to read bullshit. Remember that. More soon. Much, 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 much more. 
Uh, I'll be around. Subscribe, leave some comments. Send me your books. I charge a dollar per page or by the hour. Whichever one, get in touch. I'm going to review some of the authors who have sent me their material very soon. I'm very excited about that. Very excited. Some good stuff. Uh, all right. Yeah. Good seeing you. Hope you're well. Have a good day, guys. Ciao.